All right, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Frederick Eriksson, and um, I have the great pleasure of hosting uh, this afternoon event with Philippe de Grain. We are going to start in a short while in order to uh, get uh, us up on all the platforms where we are, are broadcasting this event. Um, let me also say to you, um, um, which is information that you should have received with the invitation as well, that you can, if you are uh, joining us directly in Zoom, you can um, you can chat directly with me and ask questions that, or put questions to me that you want me to ask to Phil. Uh, if you are in a different platform, um, we're going to view the conversations there, and and if you want to ask questions, that they are also going to be put directly to me. So, uh, even if you're not in Zoom, don't feel inhibited to raise your issues if you want to join the discussion. All right. So, very welcome, everyone, and in particular, welcome to Philip. Um, it's great to see you. Um, it's been a while since since we uh, last had a chance to uh, to meet up, um, and of course, that's one of the plights of uh, of the world today. Um, but I was very pleased to see that you are uh, promoting a new book, which has just been released, and I'm going to show it to people so they can see it directly uh, on the screen as well. It's called "Them and Us." how immigrants and locals can thrive together. And I can say straight away that this is a really, really good book. It's, it's a book that sort of walks us through a lot of the research and evidence um, that has been gathered for a long time about not just the economic aspects of, of migration, but also looking into some of the issues that have uh, propped up quite a lot in the debate uh, over the past years on issues like culture and identity, for instance. Uh, it's the perfect book um, if you want to um, uh, uh, find a good Christmas gift to, uh, to uh, people that you uh, think would need to have um, uh, uh, a solid argument in favor of open societies where also uh, um, immigrants can come and thrive. Uh, but it's also a good book, I think, for people who are already convinced about the benefits of migration because this gives you a very solid and well-grounded analysis about what we've learned uh, about migration for uh, uh, for the past decade. So I'm very pleased to see you, Phil, and very welcome to, uh, um, to our event here. Thank you, Frederick. It's, it's good to be here with you, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So let me just start by saying a few words, which is that, first of all, um, this is not your first book on migration. You've written previously on migration as well, um, but you've also written on other issues on, for instance, globalization. You had a few years ago a book out on the European experience of the crises uh, called the European Spring and, uh, and why we needed to see uh, a change uh, in the economic direction in, in, in Europe. But now you're back at migration again, and I wanted to begin by asking you, so, so why, why this book and why now? Well, I wrote my first book um, on immigration, uh, Immigrants Who Country Needs Them, back in, uh, well, it was published back in 2007, and that was a completely different world. The economy was booming, it was before the financial crisis, it was before um, uh, the rise of um, uh, the far right and populism and so on. Um, so uh, I think merely in terms of the context, uh, the debate had moved on. And, and you know, um, unfortunately, uh, well, one option would have been to, to update uh, Immigrants Who Country Needs Them. But actually, I felt that things had changed so much that, that a new book, book was called for. That, that was the, 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 the first um, uh, reason. Um, second of all, because all sorts of new is issues have, have um, uh, come, come up in the discussion. Uh, for example, climate change is now front and center in a discussion of, of migration in the way that it wasn't um, back then. Or indeed in Europe, uh, the issue of refugees is much more salient um, uh, than it was uh, back then. Um, also, as you mentioned uh, just at the start, I mean, there's been uh, a huge amount of uh, new research uh, into both the economic and the social and the cultural aspects of immigration. And given that all my books um, uh, rely on first-hand interviews and, and you know, illustrations and stories, but also backed up by solid data. 
um, when there was so much more evidence um, around, it was important to, 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 to capture that. And I think last but not least, um, my own understanding of immigration had improved uh, massively. You know, my first book was about globalization. I basically came to the immigration debate as an expert on, on trade um, rather than an expert on immigration. So my first book was really starting from first principles, reading lots of stuff, interviewing lots of people and coming to my own conclusions. Now I've been thinking, writing, uh, indeed set up a think tank called uh, Open uh, to deal with migration issues for the past 13 years. And so my own uh, knowledge of, of immigration and all the aspects had improved um, massively. So for all those reasons, whether it was the external political context, whether it was the improvements in the research or whether it was my own understanding, uh, it felt right um, uh, to, to, to write a new book. And at a time when immigration is so topical, whether it's due to um, uh, Trump in the US, Brexit in the UK, um, uh, refugees in Europe, or indeed the coronavirus crisis where immigrants have played such an important role. So we are going to basically go through some of the key arguments and the key perspectives you take in the book. But if we start off by, if you just sort of give us a short um, sort of elevator pitch for the book, what, what would you say it's about? Or what would you tell to people that haven't read it already what the book is about? Yeah, I mean, the debate about immigration is very often pitched um, as them um, versus us, of them being sort of bad, uh, threatening uh, immigrants versus us, you know, good, upstanding uh, locals. Um, and I think that that framing of the debate uh, is, you know, misguided, incorrect, dangerous. Uh, and actually, um, uh, the debate ought to be about how we can all thrive together. Um, and therefore, uh, it puts forward uh, a huge amount of economic evidence to show that uh, the contribution um, uh, that immigrants uh, make primarily to, to Western societies um, also um, addresses some of the thorny cultural and social issues uh, that arise around migration and suggests um, how they can be um, uh, addressed. Um, looks at a crucial question, which is the question I most often ask when I do public events, which is, okay, it's all well and good presenting the evidence for immigration, but how do you convince people um, who are skeptical? And so a, a lot of work on that. Um, and then, you know, concludes um, uh, on, uh, I think, an uplifting note, which is to suggest that actually um, the backlash against immigration that we've seen um, in recent years, dangerous and, and, and threatening as it is, uh, is not um, necessarily the end of the story. Actually, there are very good reasons to think that we're heading to a more liberal and cosmopolitan uh, Europe and a liberal and cos more cosmopolitan world. Um, and um, you know, happy to discuss why I think that um, uh, later in this, uh, in this discussion. Yes, this is uh, certainly something I would like to, dis to discuss a little bit later, because I think uh, one of the great strengths of the book is that it also provides more hope um, it's not a dystopian book in the sense that you, uh, you're confronted sort of uh, just with uh, uh, descriptions of what has been going on in the broader debate in Europe and America over the past couple of years, of course, where there has been sort of a, a pretty uh, sharp rise in anti-immigration views and where especially the rise of a couple of populist parties have, um, I think, uh, disrupted uh, party politics to an extent where it has become difficult for the establishment parties to maintain sort of a pro-immigration stance more generally. So, so let's get back on, on, on these notes later. But let us start with the economics here and the, the economic arguments in favor of migration. You, you lay out uh, what you called nine dividends, uh, nine economic dividends for migration. Um, and, and I would like us to, uh, to have um, a look uh, at some of them. Um, one of them is on dynamism and economic dynamism more generally. Where, where does migration plays into uh, the argument of having a dynamic economy? Well, I think by far the biggest contribution uh, that immigrants make um, is as entrepreneurs. As, in, as entrepreneurs individually, or as, as entrepreneurs co-founding firms um, uh, with uh, local people. And it's not just a story about Silicon Valley, impressive as that is, where nearly half of the startups are co-founded by immigrants and where it includes you know, really huge names like Google, 
uh, or Tesla um, or PayPal or, and so on. Uh, it's also um, true uh, in uh, the UK, uh, where nearly half of the 100 fastest growing companies um, uh, were co-founded by migrants. It's true also uh, in Germany, a country which is not known for its entrepreneurship, uh, where 42% of new companies are, are founded um, uh, by foreigners. And I think there are good reasons why, you know, I think good reasons why that's true. I mean, when you arrive uh, in a country with, you know, without a conventional career or contacts or capital, um, uh, starting off on your own uh, is a natural choice um, uh, to make. Uh, at the same time, you're more desperate to get ahead. You're more willing to take the risk of, of starting a company. Um, uh, and you may spot opportunities that locals um, don't see precisely because you have um, uh, those um, uh, diverse perspectives and experiences. Uh, and so for all those reasons, you see uh, that immigrants make a really, really outsized contribution. And I think actually what's important about that is that um, the people who succeed as entrepreneurs are not by and large people who were selected by some government scheme as exists in many countries of, of startup visas for, for would-be entrepreneurs. Um, they are people who arrive often penniless and without education and go on um, uh, to, to great things. Um, and that, tell, for me, um, it, it is a really powerful example about how so much of immigration actually is about um, serendipity. Uh, it's about creating connections between people. Uh, it's around, it's around um, diverse perspectives sparking new ideas. And it's about people who government bureaucrats might write off as being uh, unskilled and useless, actually having a burning desire to succeed and proving everyone wrong. Indeed, and you have a pretty good example now, right, in the uh, development of new vaccines in the world, where, where at least uh, one of the prominent candidates, it's this fantastic story about uh, immigrant entrepreneurs, uh, scientists that have developed several type of companies, and now they are um, um, leading a German firm who is, together with Pfizer, uh, developing one of the medicines, uh, sort of vaccines that can help us to get out of this mess. Absolutely. BioNTech, which is a, a German um, a biotech startup where it's a husband and wife team. Uh, the husband uh, is uh, arrived uh, as an as immigrant from Turkey um, with his parents as a child. Um, the, his wife, also of Turkish origin, was born in Germany. Um, and this is their, their second health start, startup. And obviously, uh, if you think the individual contribution they've made, if it brings forward even by um, a month, uh, the time at which the world can escape uh, from the coronavirus crisis, uh, then the economic benefits run into trillions of dollars. Uh, the second vaccine developed by Moderna in the US, this was, Moderna was created a US company to commercialize um, the research of a Canadian scientist and it was done um, in co-founded by a Lebanese born uh, a scientist uh, and investor. So there too is a story about uh, immigration. Uh, in, 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 so, I mean, those benefits run into the, the trillions and trillions um, and they, they frankly outweigh uh, any potential costs that you could blame uh, or, 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 or try to blame on immigrants. Yep, no, indeed. Um, another dividend you point to is on human capital and diploma. So what's, uh, what's the benefit of migration there? Well, I mean, um, the education market and university education in particular is a, is a booming market. Um, I'm based at LSE's uh, European Institute um, in, uh, in London, and the Institute itself could not exist uh, without uh, its foreign students. They make the Institute uh, viable, um, they subsidize uh, the local students, um, uh, they inject spending into the economy, they enable the, hen the hiring uh, of top professors and you know, paying all the other staff. Um, they also uh, play a key role uh, in research, you know, as any university professor will tell you, it's the um, postgrads who are helping uh, doing the heavy lifting uh, in uh, the research. And of course, uh, many international students uh, then uh, stay on uh, and having the benefits of, of um, coming from abroad and uh, a local education are particularly valuable 
uh, to locally based firms uh, in uh, knowledge industries that rely on people um, uh, with human capital. So, um, and obviously um, there have been concerns that because of the coronavirus crisis that the international student market was going to collapse this year and, and actually uh, by and large it hasn't. Uh, and I think that that trend um, uh, is, is going to continue. I think, I mean, I, just to one idea on you here, I mean, something which I've spent some time working on over the past uh, couple of months and, well, indeed years, which is on, I mean, especially for um, many economies in Europe now, I mean, one critical um, challenge they have is to make sure that their economies uh, are brought to the technological frontier, that you have the capacity to move with technology and that you can incorporate new innovations, new technologies in a way that helps to improve your chances of uh, uh, in, in, in competition on the global market. And it's, it's pretty striking to me sort of with the uh, huge uh, supply shortages we have with educated labor uh, in, in Europe, especially in, in computer engineering, uh, AI, etc that there is a, an enormous um, case to be made here for keeping your borders open to people who want to come here and to bring human capital and bring knowledge of the kind that it's, it's critically important in order to get various types of economic organizations to actually be able to move to the technological frontier um, in that sense that sort of the, the case for open borders and for migration actually gets stronger when you have technological shifts of the kind that we have today. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. And you can see that in the case, you know, of the United States. I mean, if you think if there's one country which you think might be able to rely on, on homegrown labor, it's so huge, it's so vast, it's so advanced, it's such great resources. If one country might be able to make a go of it, you'd think it would be the United States. And actually, you see that um, you know, Silicon Valley is powered by foreign talent. You can see that more than half of the computer science PhDs uh, in the United States um, are come are from abroad. Here in Europe, you see that you know, more than half of the scientists in Switzerland um, are come from abroad. And so when you're looking even at you know, a, a homegrown company, um, uh, in, in Europe, which looks like the epitome of, you know, a German or, or a, um, a, a Swedish or a, um, a Swiss or a British or a French company, you'll find very often that um, uh, the, the, the research and development uh, is done, being done by teams uh, of um, uh, foreigners and locals. Uh, and that's absolutely crucial um, to, to, to that company's uh, success. And so we talk a lot about um, you know, the globalization that takes place from uh, firms op op operating overseas. Uh, we talk much less about the globalization that happens, you know, within companies domestically from that mixture of, of, of foreign and local talent, which is so crucial. And that brings me to, to I mean, I, I'm sure you're going to come on to it, to what I call the diversity dividend, which is you know, really, really important. It's, and it's so often missed in the debate, which is, you know, it, it, immigrants are looked at individually and you know government bureaucrats judge them on do their skills add up to what we're looking for uh, do they meet the grade and actually the biggest benefits of migration often happen from the combination of um, immigrants and locals um, are sparking off each other again there's a huge amount of evidence uh, on that you can see for example that you know American scientific papers that are co-authored by foreigners and Americans um, uh, tend to be uh, cited more often uh, you can see that European regions that are more diverse, uh, their companies tend to be um, more productive. Uh, you can see that within companies, uh, those that are more diverse tend to innovate more uh, and, and so on. And you can see it actually even in football. And I know that you're a, a, a Liverpool fan. I, I'm a long suffering Arsenal fan, but you can see that in uh, Liverpool, um, you know, arguably the best team in Europe or at least certainly the best team uh, in uh, England. And, um, and they were world champions as well. And what's striking is about the combination um, of uh, foreign players jetting with each other, which goes against what many people think, which is, well, if you're going to play as a team, you all need to you know, think alike, be alike, and you're going to gel better. And actually, um, uh, it's um, that, that combination uh, of uh, different players from different countries and different playing styles, actually, which is um, uh, more effective. 
Indeed, I was actually going to ask you towards the end. Uh, uh, <laughs> I could use a Liverpool example, uh, uh, but, but, but there you go. Uh, very good. No, and it's it's we can talk for ages about Liverpool and what the the influence that um, people from different parts of the world have had on on not just the performance of the team but also on the academy and how we train young people um, in, in in football. But that's that's for another conversation. Um, Demography. I mean, Europe is a Europe is a continent where uh, several countries are are facing sort of uh, the prospects of a declining population, um, where labour supply is generally going to go down, where we have uh, uh, increasing number of, of elderly people that will need to be looked after by by elderly care workers, etc. Um, now. It's obvious sort of that one root out of this uh, democratic, demographic uh, problem is, um, is to have uh, people moving here from, from other countries and, um, and, and joining our labor force. Um, um, uh, and this is also what we've been seeing, right, in, in quite a lot of countries over the years. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm always sort of struck when I visit a hospital or sort of their little care center where my grandparents live were usually migrants who was working there. And they also did um, um, a, a, f a fantastic work sort of of a kind that I would doubt that many locals in my country would do if, if, they, if they were uh, the only, one, only ones working there. So it's, is there sort of a, uh, a dividend here uh, on demography, which isn't just about um, substituting uh, declining numbers of people in Europe, but also that we've substituting with them with people that have the capacity to do the type of work that very few people are interested to do, or at least far too few people are interested to do in our countries today. I think the, dem the, the demographic dividend uh, is absolutely crucial. Um, uh, uh, young immigrants tend to be young, uh, and they can help um, both uh, care for and pay for the growing ranks um, of uh, elderly Europeans. Um, increasing numbers of whom uh, will need care. They will also complement uh, Europeans in the labour force because, because they tend to be young and the biggest aspect of the demo demographic decline is among Europeans aged 20 to 30 and therefore they will, they will complement older, more experienced Europeans in the labour force. And uh, I start off the chapter on the demo demographic dividend by visiting um, uh, Japan. Uh, Japan, which has been loath to allow in immigrants for basically cultural and racial reasons. Uh, and where um, Japan being uh, perhaps the oldest society uh, on earth and where therefore they plowed loads of money in to develop robots to care for the elderly um, as a substitute. And what they found is that, you know, well, uh, there is a role for, for robots. Um, uh, they can't substitute um, for um, many aspects um, of human care. And as a result of that, um, the fiercely nationalistic uh, former Prime Minister Abe decided actually that you needed to open up uh, to uh, foreign care workers and there's a huge expansion of that um, uh, going on. Well, you can see that in you know, parts of Europe which are already suffering from a demographic decline uh, in Italy where a half, um, more than half of the care workers uh, are immigrants or indeed in East Germany um, where refugees have helped to repopulate um, uh, dying towns and thereby uh, keep key facilities like the local school um, open. Uh, and, you know, I think that a demographic change um, happens uh, gradually um, and, uh, and therefore, you know, it, and, and therefore slowly. And so you sort of slowly get used to it. But I think people are not quite aware as how big a shift is going to happen over the next uh, 20 years and how hard it will be to manage um, without um, uh, immigrants, uh, whether that is in terms of um, uh, working in care homes, which young Europeans don't want to do by and large, um, or whether it is as additional taxpayers to pay the pensions. And you know, Sweden uh, has a very admirable um, uh, pension system whereby the pension benefits to uh, pensioners depend on the size of the labor force and therefore um, on their, and their contributions. And therefore there is a direct connection between the benefits of migration and the pensions that um, uh, older people enjoy, but that is going to be a, a, a huge issue in Europe going forward. You've seen, you know, millennials who have suffered the brunt of the coronavirus crisis, 
um, who are going to otherwise be asked to pay for a growing the growing ranks of baby boom pensioners um, who've you know arguably in many respects had a much easier job uh, in, in in recent decades uh, and that's going to be a huge political challenge and immigrants can play a huge role uh, in um, in uh, addressing it and I suppose it's a similar type of argument that you have when it comes to dealing with the debt situation that we built up in other Western countries as well, right? That um, when you look at uh, the amount of debt that every young person now basically needs to t take care of, it, it just becomes sort of a, uh, impossible. Um, they're not just going to save for uh, their own pensions and their own future, but they're also going to deal with... Uh, um, uh, huge cohorts of people who are retired, and then of course service all the debt that we've shored up. Is that the, is that sort of the case for migration in a debt perspective? Well, yes. I mean, you know, the the OECD and others have done studies on uh, the fiscal impact of migration, and they come out with the conclusion that it is a small net benefit, i.e., that the tax revenues um, that migrants pay um, are tend to be slightly greater than the benefits of public services that um, they take out. And that's true on a flow in a flow sense, but actually in a stock sense, if you've got a, a huge stock of stack, stock of public debt, and after this coronavirus crisis, we we, we have a, a particularly large stock of that, and you boost the number of taxpayers, um, say uh, by ten percent, uh, then uh, you reduce the debt burden on every taxpayer um, um, by a ten percent, and that is a very sizable boost, and it runs into you know thousands of euros um, uh, uh, per person, uh, and um, that is almost entirely lacking uh, in um, the public debate and is a really significant uh, fiscal benefit um, of migration. All right, so there are a few other dividends that you talk about in the book as well, Phil, and um, perhaps we can just sort of go over them then quickly. I, I can put them to you right away and you can, you can talk about them. And then I'd like us to go into sort of a broader discussion around the economy and migration. But you talk about the deafness dividend, and the drudgery dividend, uh, which may sound a bit surprising. What, what is that, the drudgery di dividend? Well, I mean, drudgery means, you know, hard, unpleasant work. Um, and uh, the Treasury dividend is uh, the work that, that immigrants often do in dull, uh, difficult and relatively dangerous um, uh, jobs, whether it is construction, cleaning, um, uh, and or picking fruit, packing fruit, stacking supermarket shelves. And I think one of the positive aspects of uh, the coronavirus crisis, and there aren't many, but one of them, hopefully, um, is that is given people much greater appreciation of um, the people who were previously dismissed as you know, unskilled workers um, you know, with very little to contribute, seen as a burden or a threat, actually are the people who keep society moving during lockdowns. They are the people who enable um, um, uh, other people to, um, uh, to, to, to keep going. They're the people who clean hospitals. They're the ones who are um, disinfecting um, uh, public transport. Uh, they are the ones uh, who are delivering food or keeping your supermarket uh, stocked up. And they play a, a really, really important role. I mean, in any society, um, uh, there, there are people who do more skilled work and people who do less skilled work. And those jobs are complementary. And to dismiss um, those uh, who are doing essential work um, that most of us wouldn't want to do um, as somehow... Uh, you know, uh, unskilled and uh, useless uh, is completely untrue. And hopefully, as I said, the coronavirus crisis has created a, a greater appreciation of, of the work that is done. And it all is also emphasized how people doing the, that those jobs really, really are not substituting for local workers in any way, sense, or, shape or form. I, if you want to test the hypothesis that if only there weren't immigrants, that Europeans would be working in agriculture, picking fruit and vegetables, well, this is the year to do it. Um, with you know lockdowns and borders shut, and what you found is that you know even in a, in an unprecedented crisis, you were not finding young Europeans or hardly any young Europeans going out and saying, actually, I want to go pick asparagus um, uh, or um, dig for potatoes. Um, so it's um, uh, really really crucial to work that is being done um, uh, uh, by uh, immigrants in, in in less skilled work. And deafness, 
what is the deafness dividend? Deafness re refers to the um, highly skilled we've already um, uh, discussed, um, uh, who you know, power so much of our uh, modern uh, knowledge economy, uh, whether it is you know, in pretty pretty any much any sector that you can that, that you can uh, think of. Um, yep. All right. I mean, I, I apologize to anyone who thinks that sort of we've been uh, almost uh, in a uh, slavish fashion going through sort of point by point in the book. But I, I, I wanted us to do it because I think it's it's uh, it's a core argument of the book that you lay out uh, looking at these particular dividends. And it's also, I think, uh, points to the richness, richness of the argument, which is that uh, it isn't sort of a, a very simple and sim simplistic exercise where you just... Uh, look at some of the quantity factors or you you just take sort of a typical trade point of view in order to understand migration you go into a lot of qualitative uh, economic consequences of migration and how it helps to shape sort of a uh, an atmosphere which is open it's diverse uh, it promotes um, a dynamism etc which i think is a it's it's a really good part of the book now what i wanted to ask you phil is basically um I mean, I, I think I would know a few economists who would say, well, you know what, I agree with basically all that you're saying, but I'm still not going to take the argument that migration benefits the economy at large. Um, and they may point to sort of uh, fiscal consequences or they may point to sort of problems of um, uh, a lot of migrants uh, uh, becoming unemployed and needs to be supported by... Uh, by the government. Um, uh, what's, what's your argument to, to those? Well, I mean, there are all, all sorts of reasons why people are opposed to migration, from uh, economic reasons uh, to uh, social and cultural uh, reasons, um, or just sheer racism and, 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 and xenophobia. Uh, in terms of um, the economic consequences, I deliberately uh, organized uh, the book in terms of economic dividends that begin with D, um, because um, I want obviously to, 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 for ease of exposition, uh, but also because so often this debate is framed um, in, entirely negative, in, entirely negatively. And so, you know, you address the issue of um, the contribution that immigrants make in terms of you know, essential, uh, less skilled, unpleasant work, solely in terms of, well, what is the impact um, on local workers, and the answer to that is, you know, broadly speaking, it tends to be a slightly positive, um, and that kind of um, misses out um, uh, the crucial bit about, well, what about the contribution they make from uh, the work that they're doing and the, 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 the products and services um, uh, that they're contributing, it, and um, so th that's the reason I, I focus it that way. Now, in terms of the specific questions, um, in terms of the impact on local workers, broadly speaking, uh, it tends to be um, slightly positive. Um, if you look narrowly on uh, at the labour market and ignore all the broader effects, um, which is that you know, it tends to slightly boost local wages and it tends to slightly boost uh, local employment, you tend to see that, say, um, if um, someone comes in from uh, a developing country and goes into a menial job in a northern European country, the consequence of that is that the locals who used to do the menial job shift into doing slightly better paid, slightly higher skilled um, work. Um, and that in turn obviously has a fiscal benefit in terms of they're now doing slightly better paid work than before. Um, and that also tends to be ignored uh, in uh, the public debate. In terms of the fiscal consequences, as I've already mentioned, um, in a flow sense, the OECD, which has done you know, the most rigorous cross country studies, tend to show that it's slightly positive. Um, but again, that study, as most studies do, ignore um, the stock effect, which means that actually, if you know, at the moment, the public debt in a country is, say, 20,000 euros per person, um, even if um, the flow effect, even if the person is slightly more costly uh, in an annual sense to um, the public exchequer, uh, then they pay in taxes. Actually, there's still a net benefit because they're reducing um, the, debt, the debt burden um, per person. Now, there are big variations across countries in terms of those effects. 
um, which depend to a large extent on the nature of local labor markets. So in um, countries with flexible labor markets, uh, such as the United States and the United Kingdom, you tend to find that immigrants have higher employment rates than, than locals. Um, in countries which have um, more highly regulated labor markets uh, or markets where um, higher skill levels are required for relatively menial work, including all sorts of qualifications which may or may, not may, or, may, or may not be necessary. So for example, in France, if you want to um, collect rubbish, you need to be able to speak fluent French. It's not obvious to me that that's an essential qualification to do that. Then obviously that, that can be an issue for uh, immigrants who may struggle to find jobs that they otherwise um, would be able to do. Um, and that in turn obviously can trap them in unemployment and that in turn can you know, cause fiscal costs and that in turn can lead to you know, those immigrants being blamed for what is basically a public policy issue of a labor market which doesn't um, function um, as well um, as it should. Um, and in terms of you know, the broader social and cultural things, I think we should address those individually because we, you know, I could talk about that for like half an hour. Yeah, before we go there, just to follow up with a question here, which uh, um, comes from uh, uh, someone who is who is listening to uh, this conversation, and he, he he's from Germany, uh, and he asks, so the debate in Germany has uh, moved quite a lot. Five years ago, we talked about how migrants were depressing wages in Germany. Now we just talk about migrants causing crime and instability in our societies. Uh, that change, does it mean sort of that the argument that migration pushed down wages for natives was wrong to start with? Uh, well, as the evidence across countries is basically, and you don't, um, it goes against common sense because most people tend to think, well, if you have an increase in the supply of labor, that's going to drive down wages. But of course, an increase in the supply of labor also tends to lead to an increase in investment. And therefore, any tendency to lower wages is actually offset. And if you add the complementarities between different types of labor, whether it's skilled and unskilled, foreign and local, uh, and the change to capital, you tend to, see, you tend to find a small positive um, uh, effect. So yes, uh, uh, despite... The, the, how that often features uh, in political debate, um, there is scarcely any evidence anywhere um, uh, that migrants um, depress wages. Any studies that find that the effect is vanishingly um, small. Um, and in terms also of the impact on crime, of course, you know, some immigrants are, are, are locals, I'm sorry, sorry immig some immigrants are criminals regressively, just as, as some locals are. But uh, uh, on average, uh, immigrants tend to be, tend to commit less crime um, uh, than uh, locals do. Um, so you know the pop that that is a just a that is just a myth. Now of course there are can be shocking incidents, and you can always point to an anecdote, um, and you can say well what that individual person who happened to be done abroad uh, did is absolutely terrible, and that's that, of course that's true, and I agree with that. Um, but it it just it's absurd to then you know tar all immigrants with the same brush. If a person born in Germany commits a crime. You don't therefore say, well, all people born in Germany are wicked um, because that one person uh, did. You need to look at things in the round. That's not to excuse the, the few immigrants who, who do commit crimes, but it's to say that they're not uh, representative. All right. Um, but, but would you agree sort of with that general characterization of the debate that sort of the, the, the type of anti uh, immigration views that we had until five years ago or so, which mostly sort of economic arguments in the sense that they either sort of took our jobs or they pushed down our wages or they weren't working at all um, because they had an ability to, uh, uh, to live off the government. But now it seems to be much more of a cultural discussion which have prompted uh, at least some politicians and some political parties to become more skeptical in their views about migration. You think that is, is that a right characterization of how the debate has changed? Yeah, I mean, I think the debate has shifted. Uh, I think one of the reasons for that is that many people whose real objection to immigration was, you know, if you want to put it kindly cultural, if you want to put it less kindly, um, xenophobic, found it easier to express that objection by putting forward economic objections than cultural ones. So it's easier to say, um, I'm worried about 
um, that person with a brown face pushing my wages down or you know, reducing my access to the doctor than it is, I just don't want to live next to someone who has a brown face. Um, and so I think part of that is that, you know, with the rise of far right populism, um, with the Brexit referendum, with the impact of the refugee crisis in Europe, with the election of President Trump, that um, view, views which were beyond the pale um, now can be expressed um, much more um, openly. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think clearly, um, from a political point of view, they're much more emotionally powerful arguments. Um, you know, saying that they depress your wages um, is kind of you know threatening. Saying that they're going to destroy our way of life um, uh, or commit terrible crimes uh, is much more um, emotionally powerful. And to connect that also with a question uh, that comes from uh, uh, one of those participating here in Zoom, uh, do you think there's also geopolitical dimension in this or something which at least relates to uh, our own self-confidence of being sort of a, a powerful economic or powerful political region in the world? And I think that you can apply that to America as well, of course, that you know we're getting uh, many more um, uh, people who are skeptical of migration simply because um, uh, we're not that confident about ourselves anymore. I think that's very true. Um, I think that many people um, within society have lost eco social economic status or feel they've lost social economic status or fear that they will in future lose social economic status. A and on top of that, um, you know, if you were at bottom of the pile uh, in Europe before, you could ease, at least look down at the rest of the world and say, I'm comfortably above them. And actually now you can see China and other countries um, uh, which are uh, coming up behind and threatening to overtake. And therefore, um, uh, that increases the, the feeling um, of anxiety. And I would turn the argument around and, and, and say, well, you know, if um, uh, we are uh, to continue prospering in the 21st century, where Europe is going to matter less in almost any scenario, demographically and uh, economically. And then one key advantage that we have um, or can have uh, is um, uh, open liberal societies, which allow uh, different people to spark off each other and to thrive. Um, and if we don't want to become simply um, uh, a, a huge retirement home, um, uh, eating away our capital, uh, then um, those uh, young foreigners um, are, are an absolutely crucial element of that. And that's something which, um, except on a very tiny scale, uh, China is unlikely, it's a, a strategy that China is unlikely um, to uh, be willing or able um, uh, to follow. Now, you write um, quite a lot in the book, uh, which I think is, is uh, it's also one of the strengths in the book that you go into all these, these sort of uh, arguments that is often heard now against uh, migration, which are arguments based on culture, identity uh, type of issues. Now, I, I find some of these uh, arguments against migration to be difficult to understand in the first place. I mean, I can... You know, I, I can understand sort of that in the broad abstract, abstract of things. You can see sort of that there are cultural differences between, you know, someone growing up in northern part of Sweden, as I did, and someone who sort of came, grew up in Syria. I mean, of course, we, we, we come from different cultures and different understandings. Um, but every time you uh, try to understand the argument a little bit more, it, it becomes difficult, almost sort of cartoonish in a way that some people make the argument that it becomes difficult to exert your own culture and your own uh, cultural expression simply because there are people uh, from a different culture that lives near next to you. But I, I mean, I, I can't point to sort of any society where that actually happens. I mean, even you know, I mean, societies that I know quite a lot, like the Swedish society or Nordic societies or the UK society, it's not sort of generally a problem for people to express their own Swedishness or Britishness uh, 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 even if there are a lot of other people living there. So could you help me here? What, what, what is the cultural argument against migration about? Well, I would say that many people 
are nostalgic um, for the past. Um, they're nostalgic for the past when um, they were young um, and, that, and they look back fondly on those years. Um, and when Europe was less diverse um, than it is now, and they attribute or associate um, many of the things that they don't like about Europe today uh, to immigrants. Um, and in a sense, they would like to turn back at the clock. Um, and I think the power of you know, nostalgia, you, it's epitomized by Make America Great Again, uh, Donald Trump's um, uh, slogan. And obviously, um, you know, those are emotionally, those are very, very powerful um, uh, arguments. Where, I mean, it's also captured by the Brexit take back control uh, kind of thing, as in we had control before, we don't anymore. And those are very, very powerful um, uh, e emotional arguments. But like you say, if you start looking at the facts, I mean, I mean one of the reasons, or the biggest reason why um, European societies are much, much more diverse than they were before. Well, there are two that have very little to do with immigration. The first uh, is due to um, the 1960s and um, the revolution of social liberalism, um, women's rights, um, uh, gay rights, um, people feeling much, much freer to reject tradition and live life as they, as they please. Um, uh, secondly is um, the globalization, well, not the globalization of, of people, but the globalization more generally. Uh, whereby, you know, um, uh, all the, the, the products um, uh, that we find in the shops uh, or um, uh, the culture that we uh, consume uh, or, you know, the films that we watch and so on uh, is much more international than it was before. I mean, you can just see, for example, the, the top pop band in the world is a, is a Korean K-pop band, uh, which certainly wouldn't have been the case uh, in the Sweden that you were growing up in. Um, and I agree with you, but I don't think uh, there is anything um, to stop a uh, liberal, diverse society living together uh, peacefully and productively, and each people, everyone um, pursuing their own uh, tastes and interests and uh, forming uh, uh, their own identity and valuing different things, uh, provided we all stick by the rules of, of, of liberal democracy, um, uh, which is, you know, that um, the, the rules are set by um, uh, elected politicians, and when those politicians lose, uh, they uh, leave office gracefully, unlike someone we could mention, um, uh, and that if you want to change the law, you campaign to do so um, peacefully um, or through the ballot box, um, not by um, uh, planting bombs, uh, and that you know, for the most part, you know, people agree um, that uh, even if you don't agree with the law, um, you have to respect it, and that basically provides uh, the basis for a peaceful coexistence. You don't need to uh, agree with your neighbor. You might not like uh, their lifestyle choices, but you each mind your own business and, and get on with your life. And hopefully you can also uh, find connections with your neighbor uh, as well. Um, and it, I agree with you. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to me that it doesn't seem to me um, that there is any, any, any obstacle to that. Um, the same, I mean, if you define national identity as being purely something about, inverted commas, blood, uh, about ethnicity, then yes, you know, it cannot in incorporate people who are, um, uh, who, who came from different countries. Uh, but all European countries, more or less, or most European countries have moved towards um, a civic notion of identity, which is, of, of national identity, which is, you know, based on um, clearly uh, local rules um, and, and, and traditions, but doesn't mind where you particularly uh, came from. Um, and which does, of course, involve uh, uh, local ca cultural characteristics. So, you know, for example, in, in Germany, you speak German, and in Sweden, you speak Swedish, um, uh, but otherwise uh, is based around uh, principles about how society should be organized, whether it is liberal democracy or, or tolerance of differences. And I think, you know, again, I think that, that you, you very well can accommodate um, a, a country where some people um, uh, are fervently nationalistic and, and other people aren't, as long as you don't try and impose um, uh, your views on others. That's where, the, that's where the problem comes. And, you know, it's a problem which is age old. We had wars of religion before where people weren't content with saying, I'm Catholic or I'm Protestant. They, it's, if I'm Catholic, 
everyone has to be Catholic and I'm Protestant, everyone has to be Protestant. And the answer is, well, no, there is no solution to that. Either you kill each other or you separate. Um, the, the solution that we found for coexistence uh, is, uh, you know, uh, liberal democracy and tolerance of differences. And it works, it works you know, very well. Um, uh, and um, we focus a lot on uh, the sharp edges of uh, the problem. But for the most part, it enables peaceful coexistence between radically different people, between radical environmentalists um, and Marxists, um, uh, between people on the far right and on the far right, uh, on the far left. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it's only um, uh, in, in a very few limited cases uh, that, that, that an issue arise. Another argument that comes into uh, play here, which is sort of a, almost a cultural based argument, or at least an argument which is around uh, problems of integration is that, and you uh, looked and you sort of, you comment on this previously, but perhaps we should say something more about it, which is that uh, the, uh, uh, in some countries, uh, uh, in some metropolitan areas in particular, you can see sort of that there is a, a linkage between crime networks and gangs and migration that you've had um, uh, sort of a, a, a general rise of of uh, sort of instability in uh, in in some cities, etc. Um, I mean, this is one of the arguments that you can hear quite often now in in around Europe, sort of in in the sense that um, you've created sort of um, uh, migrant cultures which have become very close to, uh, to, to, to crime networks. What, what would be your argument against that? Well, I mean, it's certainly true that, um, that um, crime networks can, can sometimes be based on, on ethnic links. And obviously the Italian mafia, which then transplanted itself to the United States, uh, is a classic uh, example of that. And nowadays, you know, there are Russian mafias and Albanian mafias and and, um, uh, and and so on. Um, so there is a, there is an element of truth uh, to that. But the counter argument to that is that you know hardly any immigrants are actually members of those crime networks. Um, and as I said, overall immigrants are less less likely to to commit crime than locals. And therefore, the way to address uh, those issues uh, is um, uh, to target the particular criminals or criminal networks rather than to target all immigrants with um, uh, the, the same uh, brush. And very often, obviously, uh, these uh, crime networks which are based on um, ethnicity aren't necessarily, uh, don't necessarily uh, involve uh, migrants. You know, they can involve, um, you know, Colombian gangsters who operate in London, but actually are not resident uh, in London. You know, they're selling cocaine from, from, from Colombia. Or indeed, you know, Russians who hop on a plane from uh, from from Moscow, and so the the linkage to migration is not always um, there. But the most important thing is to say, you know, uh, even when you can point to crime networks which are based around um, ethnicity, um, one locals commit crime too, and two uh, most immigrants don't. And how do you view um, to take sort of an example, and this has been written about quite substantially in the past weeks, of course, with, after the killing in France of uh, a school teacher who was beheaded because he was depicting uh, uh, the Islamic prophet and teaching uh, pupils about blasphemy. Um, um, some would make the argument that, well, you know, this is the price you have to pay if you allow uh, if you keep borders open and if you have sort of large cohorts of, of Muslim people who's going to come and live here, they have a radically different view about things that our societies keep sacred, like, for instance, freedom of expression. So uh, in this case, their argument would be uh, there's a conflict here between open liberal societies and, and the type of migration we have in Europe. Well, um, obviously, the atrocities committed by um, terrorists uh, in, the name of Islamist, is, in the name of Islamist ideology um, are evil and wrong um, and uh, need to be addressed in proportionate and effective and severe in a severe manner. Um, uh, at the same time, um, there is an evil twin of Islamist terrorism, which is um, far-right terrorism, 
um, and the two kind of feed on each other. They both hate Western liberal societies and they both seek um, uh, to uh, undermine them. Um, and actually the data shows that um, there are more deaths now from far right terrorism than there is from Islamist terrorism, which is not to excuse Islamist terrorism at all. It's simply to, to put it in, in, in context. Um, I think the second thing to say is that, you know, um, while um, uh, some, some immigrants or the ch some children of immigrants turn to terrorism, it's a tiny number. It's far too, it's still far too many, but it's, it's deeply regrettable. It's a tiny number. Um, most uh, immigrants not only aren't terrorists, but don't sympathize with them. And we have the data that we have show, for example, that um, among Europeans or indeed among Americans, there is more sympathy for terrorism actually among locals than there is among um, Muslims. I mean, there's a fraction of higher difference, but not, not um, uh, but, but, but there still is one. And that the argument in general um, uh, that um, Muslims are extremely illiberal and unable to fit into Western societies um, isn't true. Now it's true that on average, they tend to be slightly more social, but they tend to be more socially conservative um, than people born in Europe. Ironically, in that sense, actually, they're more like um, their critics on the far right, um, in the sense um, uh, uh, of, of their view, uh, their social conservative view uh, of society. Um, and uh, as someone who is uh, deeply liberal myself, I find that regrettable. Um, at the same time, um, what you what you find is that views shift over time. You find that uh, the, the children and grandchildren um, born uh, in Europe uh, tend uh, to be more liberal. Not all are, um, but but tend to be. Um, uh, and that um, in any case, um, uh, the the numbers are, um, are are relatively small. Which is not to say that we don't have a problem with the liberalism in Europe. I think we do. I think we have a problem with the liberalism on the far right, and we have a, a problem with. On, on, on the Islamist side. Uh, and clearly we need to do um, much more uh, to address it. But I don't think shutting the borders is the answer. I mean, I grew up in Britain um, with IRA terrorism. We had bombs going off all the time. And throughout that period, not only were there, you know, not closed borders, but actually people from Ireland could come across to the UK without even showing their passport. So it's like the Schengen area uh, in continental Europe. Uh, and nobody questioned it and nobody said, well, just because um, uh, there is a tiny minority of IRA terrorists or indeed a larger section of population in Ireland who do have some sympathy for IRA terrorists, that somehow that we should, um, that we should stop people um, uh, moving. Um, I think that you need to, it needs to be um, proportionate, it needs to be uh, uh, effective. Um, uh, yeah, no, and it's it's um, this is a personal anecdote. But when I arrived in Britain as a uh, as a young student in the early 1990s, I was uh, warned by the university of, and uh, sort of given suggestions by the uh, university of how I should act in the uh, in the event of uh, a bomb going off uh, at university. And uh, they weren't talking about Muslim terrorists back then; it was terrorists uh, much closer to home. Um, I think this discussion also relates to sort of the uh, the perspectives and ideas that you lay out in the book for the future and that you also began talking about previously about uh, how different factors are uh, moving us in the direction of sort of uh, open cosmopolitan type of cultures. Um, there are people who take a different view and who would say that, well, you know, um, it's probable that uh, migration is actually going to go down and that we're not going to become more open as societies, that we're getting older, that we have, and sort of with a lot of more older people around, we're going to become less open to other people, to other cultures. Um, some would also make the argument that you were, were, were alluding to pretty recently, which is that, well, a lot of sort of the migrants that have come, they may change over generations, but they're still pretty conservative in their views in the sense that uh, they don't like other migrants and they don't like uh, liberal societies. They don't like uh, gay marriage or sort of other parts of um, social modernization that we've gone through over the past uh, couple of decades. And as a consequence of that, they may 
uh, sort of join hands with very conservative people in, in, in making European societies uh, less open to anything which is different from, uh, from us and, and what we are. So, um, so if you start by, if you can sort of lay out your optimistic view sort of of the future and then respond to well, what, what sort of, what are your counter arguments to those who, who suggest that the future is actually going to be different? Well, I think my concluding chapter is called The Future is Open. Um, and um, that is obviously a play on words. It's, uh, it's both uh, a hope that it ought to be open, but also a recognition that um, we don't know whether it's going to be more closed or more open. Um, and I think in the short term, clearly there are strong trends pushing towards um, uh, greater uh, closure, um, you know, wh whether it is um, you know, the rise of uh, far-right populism, whether it is uh, the perception since the coronavirus crisis uh, that strangers and foreigners in particular are a health risk, um, uh, whether it is um, uh, aging societies and n nostalgia for a less diverse past, uh, or indeed uh, fears of um, loss of social economic status from people um, uh, who used to have good manufacturing jobs uh, and uh, so on. And certainly you can see the countries can um, go off into a, uh, onto, into a negative spiral or at least go into, uh, 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 yeah. the, 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 the trend is not towards um, continued openness. And you can see that obviously in the United States where hopefully the four year Trump interlude um, uh, is an aberration. Uh, and you can see that uh, in, in Britain where obviously the Brexit is a more enduring um, a mistake with you know uh, potentially catastrophic uh, consequences. I think the reasons for optimism, uh, though, about the long-term trends are are very powerful. I mean, they are what I've already alluded to about um, the increased demand for foreign talent and the role that plays in economic success. Um, the the need uh, for young people uh, in uh, aging uh, societies. And crucially, absolutely crucially, is the vast difference in attitudes uh, between uh, young, predominantly university educated uh, Europeans and older, um, much less educated Europeans. And there, the shifts are you know, absolutely huge. And so, whereas the debate about my migration is often framed well, you know. Um, it might have economic benefits, but diversity is a cost or a challenge or whatever. Um, actually, if you ask young people um, in, in Europe today what their view about uh, openness is, and openness not to other Europeans, but openness to people from poorer countries outside Europe, and you'll find that young um, university educated, uh, better educated, um, are much, much, much more positive, which I think, you know, given that ultimately the, the young people are going to um, reshape politics, um, that what we're seeing now with populism potentially is the last hurrah um, of uh, an older generation um, uh, which um, you know, wants to turn the clock back and that you know, young people potentially actually after the coronavirus crisis where they're being made to pay so much of the cost of protecting the elderly, say enough, we want a different kind of society. And you can see inklings of that um, in politics around Europe with the rise of um, a green parties or liberal parties which are openly much more enthusiastic about migration often than mainstream centre-right or centre-left parties which were you know more ambiguous about it um, and potentially therefore um, uh, creating a much more uh, open future um, in, 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 in future and I think part of the task for people who believe uh, in openness and um, uh, liberal societies such as ourselves is to try to win over um, the moderate skeptics. And that is not by pandering to xenophobia uh, or uh, to racism, um, but uh, to try to uh, persuade people who are open to persuasion. And that means uh, not just using facts and arguments, but also stories, anecdotes, and, um, and emotional uh, arguments. It means appealing to people with different values. So in the book, I make an argument that you need to make a patriotic case for migration. I mean, I'm not a nationalist in any way, shape or form. Um, many people are patriotic 
well, most people are patriotic and, and want what's right for their country. That doesn't necessarily mean that they need to be anti-immigration. If you can make a case that you know immigration can make your country greater and stronger, uh, then you can appeal to people um, for whom patriotism is incredibly uh, important. Um, it's about encouraging people to mix, um, where you know the most powerful impact on people's views um, is when the other onto whom you project your fears and fantasies, you actually meet the other and you realize that it's a human being uh, like you with whom you have things in common. And that tends to change your view, not just of the individual, uh, but of the group. And on top of that, better government policies, policies like I've partly alluded to, and um, a more responsible politics, whereby mainstream centre-left and centre-left parties, centre-right and centre-left parties, which all too often try and pursue far-right populist votes, um, in a, actually um, thereby legitimising those far-right views, uh, ought instead um, to follow the Joe Biden strategy uh, and uh, to reject far-right populism uh, in order uh, to defeat it. All right. Thank you very much, Phil. I think that also served as a very, very good closing statement, um, uh, a word of optimism. Um, and I think there are uh, uh, lots of other things that you also point to in the book, which I, uh, I suggest, uh, or at least I would propose, uh, is a good basis for thinking positively about the future, and not just about the, the facts and the arguments that you enroll, but also looking sort of at the, the, the broader uh, picture of of societies being successful and societies being able to address sort of some of the key challenges they're all facing and 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 that work is certainly not going to be uh, easier if they close the borders to uh, uh, to migrants uh, or if they uh, try to go sort of in 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 manners that are highly nationalistic or at least um, based on the notion that they don't need to have uh, uh, people from other cultures and other countries coming to them. Um, uh, the book is called Them and Us, How Immigrants and Locals Can Thrive Together. And as I said, this is a perfect Christmas book to give to anyone you think need a, a stronger argument in favor of, uh, of migration. Or if you have, um, uh, as, as Phil pointed to towards the end, um, uh, a moderate skeptic who needs to uh, uh, Sort of learn more and get a different account of migration. Uh, this is also a very good, uh, uh, good book for them. It's not just a book for those of us who already are convinced. Let me also uh, uh, say uh, thank you uh, in the first place to uh, you, Phil. Uh, thanks for writing a great book. Thanks for taking the time to join us here this afternoon. Let me also thank those of you who have watched and listened on different platforms. I know that there were a lot more comments and questions that were put to me that we didn't have a chance to go into. Um, but this is far from a, a, a discussion that is going to end with this particular event. It's going to, I, I think, live with us for quite some time. And I'd like us to come back uh, uh, in the future to discuss uh, the same issues we've discussed today, because I think they are vitally important for uh, the future of Europe and the future of the West. So thank you to all of you. Thanks, Phil. Uh, have a good afternoon and see you soon again.